On the phone with me right now is Stephen Meyer, who is uh, Dr. Stephen Meyer, I should say, director of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. Dr. Meyer, welcome back to the program. Great to be with you, Lars. Good to have you on. And tell me about this. I've, I've always been a proponent of intelligent design, not because I'm a scientist or particularly well-educated in it, but I think I'm well-read in this. Why is it Ball State University in Indiana doesn't like intelligent design? Well, they've got a couple of uh, uh, physics and astronomy professors who are well-known proponents of intelligent design, and they started getting heat from a group called the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which uh, was attempting to uh, get, get the university to, to get rid of these professors. And uh, one of them, Eric Hedin, was uh, kind of brought up short for a course that he was teaching. It was, he wasn't actually teaching intelligent design, but he, it was a course on the boundaries of science, talking about the nature and the limits of science. And he had some books on his... Uh, on his uh, bibliography for student reading, which included books that were both critical and supportive of intelligent design. And this, uh, this group decided to go after him and tried to embarrass the university. And the uh, university president, rather than uh, standing up to this, uh, decided to uh, pass a kind of, or, or, uh, promote a kind of gag order saying that no one in the university science de- department could discuss the issue under the rubric of academic freedom, of course. I guess that surprises me coming from a state like Indiana, which is relatively conservative, but but it also from a university to say to professors, uh, this is not a place of academic freedom. It's not a place where people can advance different theories uh, and, and feel free to speak about them. To put a gag order on a scientist on the basis that his point of view is unpopular with some? Well, it's the very opposite of the meaning of academic freedom. It's really Orwellian because academic freedom is precisely the ability to to question the consensus view, the majority view. And this college president said, "Well, uh, the, the 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 professors in in their science division could not discuss intelligent design because it was at odds with the majority view, which is a, a you know obviously." and a huge abridgment of the very concept of academic freedom. I mean, if science is based on the majority view, maybe they should make Professor Hedin just drink hemlock. I mean, maybe well, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe they can go out and, uh, you know, put him on the rack till he corrects it, his thinking. It, well, exactly. And, and, you know, the interesting thing is that so many professors and scientists are beginning to become very uh, uh, sympathetic to the idea of intelligent design because in both in biology but also in physics and astronomy, there's so much evidence for uh, design in the universe and design in life. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a viewpoint that's growing, and you, you, some people may not like it, but it's, it's one of the, the ideas that's in circulation. And certainly universities are supposed to be about allowing professors and students to talk about current ideas. Dr. Meyer, can you do people a favor? Give me your best capsule version of what intelligent design is because I know that a lot of people have a tough time getting that across as, well, this is why we believe that this didn't all come about by accident or, or random selection. Exactly. The, idea, the definition of, intel, of the theory of intelligent design is this. It's the idea that there are certain features of life and of the universe that are best explained by a designing intelligence or an intelligent cause rather than an undirected materialistic process like natural selection and random mutation. The evidence for intelligent design is manifold. You find it in lots of fields. In physics and astronomy, uh, uh, physicists are talking about the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics that allow for the possibility of life. Life is, uh, is a hard thing to produce, and the universe that we live in is a Goldilocks universe. The, the laws of physics are, uh, have many parameters that allow life to exist. In biology, we're finding things like molecular machines and digital code, DNA stores, uh, what is essentially a software program that is directing the construction of very sophisticated uh, protein parts and machinery. And um, I discuss this in my new book, Darwin's Doubt, which is about the explosion of this kind of digital information that takes, that takes place in uh, some very pr- uh, uh, exciting events in the history of life, like the Cambrian Explosion, where you get a whole new group of animals coming into the fossil record very quickly and we know that from from our knowledge of what it takes to build an animal, that there must be a lot of must have been an explosion of information in order to build those animals coming to the record so quickly. What we know from experience is that information always arises from an intelligent source. 
whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a section of a, a book or a, um, uh, a section of computer code or even in, information embedded in a radio signal, it always arises from an intelligent source. And so when we see these ex explosions of information in the history of life, there are many scientists, me included, who think that what we're looking at is evidence of a designing intelligence playing a role in the, in, the, in the process that gave rise to life. I'm glad you mentioned your new book, and I also want to mention Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design, because no, th there are some huge gaps. If you simply follow Darwin and believe in natural selection and evolution, there are some gigantic both physical and informational gaps uh, in, in the record uh, that don't support the idea that this just all came about uh, by, by somehow you know, having these primitive organisms that grow into these very complex organisms like us uh, because, because there had to be some place where the information got put in. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, you would absolutely. expect them almost to go the other direction. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the first book is about a question that Darwin didn't address, which is the origin of the first life. Many people don't know that he didn't have an answer to that. He attempted to explain the origin of new forms of life from simpler pre-existing forms, but he presupposed the existence of the simplest form of life. And that has turned out to be a very big problem precisely because we now know that you need reams and reams of digital code stored in DNA to build even a simple living cell. The second book, Darwin's Doubt, is about a problem with this, the part of the theory that he did address, which is the biological evolution. And it's this event in the history of life called the Cambrian Explosion, where all the major groups of animals occur very rapidly in the fossil record. And I like the way you put it. It's a gap in the fossil record. It's a gap in the fossil evidence. But it's also an informational gap, because to build those animals, we know you need lots of code. And what we know from experience is that code always comes from a programmer, from an intelligence. And it looks, it looks to many of us that what we're looking at is, is precisely in fossil record. We are looking at evidence of, of intelligent design in the history of life. Yeah, and how do you take this very simple animal or simple organism and, and grow it into something more complicated just by accident? It, it doesn't make sense that it would add up that way. Uh, what's the website you'd recommend people go to if they're curious about this and willing to be more open-minded than the trustees at Ball State? You know, that's a very good connection. Uh, yeah, I'd go to darwinsdoubt.com, and uh, th that will lead you uh, to information about this current book, and then there's also discovery.org, where we have information about the whole intelligent design research community and all the scientists that are involved in this effort, as well as this, uh, these unfortunate two professors at Ball State who have really been targeted by this gag order. And by the way, if you want something pedestrian about at my level, Dr. Meyer, I'll suggest that people go back and watch that great movie by Ben Stein called Expel. Expel is brilliant. Yeah, it's, ben, it, it really, yeah. and when you see some of those uh, evolutionists get walked into a corner by the questioning of Ben Stein, It'll send you away with a whole different perspective if you don't have it already. Dr. Meyer, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Lars. Uh, glad to do it. You're listening to Compass Media.